Thank you, Brad. Good evening, everyone. We're certainly happy to have you here tonight. And trust that as we worship our God, that good will be accomplished to the glory of Jehovah God. So many things I want to say to you tonight. First thing I want to say is, I know my wife would want me to get up here and say, let's sing God is so good. Because after all, let me tell you what, I mean, we've had a tough month, but I know, I can tell you, God is good. Never made a mistake, and he hadn't made a mistake either by my wife now going home. The problem that I've had, and I trust and pray you'll bear with me, I have a problem with Guy McDaniel, because I miss her. It's almost 67 years it doesn't seem right, but I know one thing. When she was here and I preached the last sermon and she heard it, rescue the parish, and she was sitting right over there, my Martha, and in my mind I can see her tonight. And oh, how precious she's always been to me, and she is now. Bear with me, please. Please stand. Let's sing God is so good. God is everybody. He is. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. Jesus is real. Jesus. Jesus is real, Jesus is real, he's so real to me, he saved my soul, he saved my soul, he saved my soul, and he made me oh everybody I pray isn't it wonderful I praise his name I praise his name he's so good to me thank you so much <clears throat> I want to tell you in the beginning I'm thankful that Bobby Nixon came to me one day that right after my wife passed away and he put his arm around me and his brother guy he said you've got a big family and he was talking about you and he said and every one of them every one in that family loves you I love every one of you from the bottom of my heart and so did Ann. I want you to know it if I've ever said anything or done anything against anyone in this building or anywhere. I ask God to forgive me and for you to do the same. I feel so blessed. So <coughs> I met with my family. Ann asked me just several weeks ago, she said, honey, are you getting tired driving? Oh, but you see, I want to come see the family because you're part of me and I'm part of you because we love each other. And oh, how you have just poured out that love in every way possible. I couldn't begin to tell you. Financially, you've helped me. You've mostly, you've helped me. Tommy and, and Jeff have been so lenient, so encouraging, good families. And boy, don't we have one of the finest young preachers, Daniel and Julie. They brought, even brought food over to us uh, over in Huntsville, Alabama. And I could call oh, so many names, all of your names. I want you to know from the bottom of my heart, I love you and I pray to God that whatever time he leaves me, that I will be able to work and serve God together with you. Because my sermon tonight is dealing with a man in the Old Testament that we're many of us are aware of. 
Why, when we go to 2 Samuel chapter 12, we find there's David. And David, the king of Israel. Ah, did he need help? Oh, he, he really, he needed help to find himself, to see himself as he really was. And you remember in 2 Samuel that when Nathan came to him, and he told the story about the rich man. They had all the flock, oh, just plenty of uh, flock in his flock, cattle in his flock. And when, a, when they had a guest, he took the poor man's. Yeah, he took the poor man's ewe lamb, slaughtered it, and had it prepared for his guest. David was so wrought, he was so angry. Why the man that has done this thing shall surely die. And you have to restore it fourfold. And Nathan said, David, you're the man. Huh? And then he explained to him what it's all about. And David said, I've sinned. And he had. But one of the prices of sin is the sacrifice that you're going to have to make. David had to give up his son that he loved so much. And we find it in my record in 2 Samuel chapter 12. Well, he won't eat. He's praying. And he's hoping and praying that his son might live. And you remember, after a short while, the boy died. And when David realized there were different ones that were saying things or his servants, David said, is the boy, is the child, is the child dead? And the answer is yes, he is dead. David got up, washed himself, went and worshiped the Lord, ate, and the servant said, this is odd. Why are you doing this? Let's read those verses together. Nathan departed unto his house, and the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. David therefore besought God for the child. He's praying for him, begging. And David fasted, and he went in and lay all night upon the earth. And the elders of his house arose, went to him to raise him up from the earth. But he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. And it came to pass on the seventh day that the child died. And the servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead. For they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spake unto him, and he would not hearken unto our voice. How will he then vex himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. And therefore David said unto his servants, is the child dead? And they said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth. He washed himself and anointed himself, changed his garment, his apparel, came into the house of the Lord. And what did he do? He worshiped God. Then he came to his own house, and when he inquired, required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. And then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive, but when the child was dead, thou didst rise and eat bread. And he said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who can tell whether God will be gracious to me that the child may live? But now he's dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. It was 1040, the night before Thanksgiving 2022, the night before our son's birthday on the 27th. The beautiful wife that God gave to live with me for 66 months. Here it would have been 67. The last day of this month is suddenly breathing her last breath. When I told her how bad her condition was, I told her and made a promise to her. I would not leave 
I would be with her to the very end. And I sat there three days and three nights, 25 minutes, and went and got some vitamins one time. I sat there by my beautiful wife. And the nurse came in. It's this late. And the nurse said, after she examined her, we had just heard Ann. And she said, she's gone. That's my wife. That's my life. He's everything to me. I couldn't realize how much I loved her. Until then, as I clasped her hands, and I kissed her and told her how much I truly loved her. You know, folks, we need to do everything we're going to do with our loved ones while they're with us. Robin L. Robertson told me, Robin L. said one day, it hadn't been too long ago, God, if you're going to do anything with Ann, while you're both doing pretty well, you ought to do it. Well, you know what happened? We got together with a sweet couple, Matt and Leah. They drove us. We went up, had the most marvelous three-day vacation you could have possibly had. Even the last day, my wife spoke up and told Matt, I wish we didn't have to go home today. She thoroughly enjoyed it. And then we came home. But she didn't get in. And you know the rest of the story. How do you explain this? All I say is, I know God is good. And I know that God worked it out for her best. Ah, so much is said about death that we don't understand. Ah, oh, it's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. Hebrews 9, 27, in Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5, the living know that they shall die. Ah, oh, we can learn things about those that have died. What about David? I mean, what about Abraham? We well, lived to be 175 years, the Bible says. But guess what? Time came for Abraham to die. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man, full of years, and was gathered to his people. Abraham was buried next to Sarah, his wife. Genesis 25, 9 to 10. Who else was buried in that cave of Machpelah? Well, listen to it. In Genesis 23, 17 through 18, in the field of Ephraim, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field in the cave which was therein, and all the trees that were in the field that were in all the borders round about were made sure unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth before all that went in at the gate of the city. Ah, there was Abraham and Sarah. There was Isaac and Rebekah. There was Jacob and Lee, rather Jacob and Leah. And, and there was Joseph. I took my wife where my mom and dad was buried. She lays her body, does, in that cemetery. I have a place to be placed by her side. Just over there Friday. Tough time, isn't it? When you have to go back and you have to walk off and you leave the remains of those that you love. But there's not only Abraham, there's Stephen that we can consider with regards to, you remember how, what a tremendous thing the Bible tells us about Stephen. He was a devout man. He died for Jesus. And the Bible tells us great lamentation was made over Stephen. Well, you can look at Paul in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 6, the time of my departure, he says, this is the hand. There are certain things that I have really, after Anne passed away, been thinking about that I want to share with you and the lesson will be yours. Who will die? Every one of us know. Every one of us in this building 
we'll meet the appointment of death. I don't know when, but we will all die. Hebrews 9, 27, when will we die? Boy, wasn't that a great lesson that Daniel had on Hezekiah? And that was God sending out Isaiah to tell Hezekiah. And if Hezekiah had not turned to God and begged God to live, that's what God intended to do. But why will we die? Well, the obvious answer is it's God's appointment because of sin. Romans 3, verse 23. But we not understand that when death comes, it's a separation of the spirit from the body. And as the body without the spirit is dead, so is faith without works is dead. James 2, verse 26. Yes, there's so much in the Bible about death. Number one, did you know when Anne died at 11.40? Anne was a child of God. And you know what the Bible says about that? Number one, Psalms 116, verse 15, precious. Precious in the sight of God is the death of his saints. It was precious. Number two. And boy, this one, I have preached at many of your relatives' funerals. I have preached it throughout the land. But when I experienced the death of my wife, I then saw what God was saying. The Bible says... John said that he heard a voice from heaven. And so it's from heaven. What is now said, it is from heaven. It is from God. And notice what it says. Blessed are the dead. The dying the Lord from henceforth. Yea, said the Spirit. They shall rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Precious, happy in the Lord. If you're in the Lord, you're okay. You say, I, do, I, do I weep because I worry. No, I don't worry about Ann. I worry about Guy. She already has experienced it. She knows what's on the other side. God had already told us, and now my family is experiencing it. And we know that she and you know that she served God so faithfully. <laughs> know how she thanked every one of you who would speak to her. And you know what trouble she's had with Alzheimer's. And she would go home and she'd say, Shirley, and mention Shirley, different ones by name that she could remember that was my end and now she's happy I know don't guess about it I believe it because the Bible says it and I preach it and now I'm experiencing it ah but then thirdly when Paul writes in 1st Thessalonians chapter 4 he concludes after talking about those that die. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Words? Ah, they're so comforting and so helpful to us. The psalmist then also writes, The days of our years are threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and as Hollis leg, I never dreamed that he'd be leading that song this morning. I already had the thing made up to use it. And then we fly away. The night when the Lord came for my wonderful wife, she went with him. I want to suggest to you, my friends, 
Where does the Spirit go when it leaves? Well, let's just notice that real quick. It came to pass that the beggar died, we know of that, from Luke 16. And he was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Wouldn't that be a marvelous translation? Being carried by the angels? Which I think my wife was. What? And was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom? He's where? Where there's happiness, joy, contentment, peace. Who would ever want to leave that place? If they could. But what about this other fellow? The fellow who is known as the rich man. The rich man also died in his spirit and in hell or Hades. He lifted up his eyes. Guess what? He could see. What else? Being in torments, he could feel. He could feel pain. And he seeth what else? Of all people, he could see the man that had just wanted the crumbs from his table. He saw that beggar who wanted only the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. Ah, wasn't that a huge reversal? Which would you choose? Everybody would choose to be the beggar. Why? Because of where he went. The rich man now could not so much as get a drop of water. Ah, but the poor man now is inside Abraham's bosom. Where would you be if you died tonight? <coughs> Where would I buy, be tonight? We hadn't anticipated Ann's death. But in three days after she fell, she passed into eternity. Is it well with your soul? Your soul. Soul that God gave you. One minute in heaven will be worth every single tear you've ever cried. And I thought this was real interesting. Looked up in Psalms 56, verse 8. Thou tellest my wonder. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? Every tear that is shed is in God's book. I read this. I'm sure you've heard it before. The clock of life is wound but once, and no man has the power to tell just when the hands will stop. 11, 40 p.m., November 26, 20, 22 for Anne. At late or early hour, to lose one's wealth is sad indeed. To lose one's health is more. To lose one's soul is such a loss that no man can restore the present. What? Are we listening? Right now, the present only is our own. So live, love, toil with the will. Place no faith in tomorrow for the clock. The clock may then be still. Jesus Christ is the answer. You know and I know it. Jesus preached a place for people to come unto him. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. He tells us he's the only way to get to heaven. Ah, we can get there, but we've got to go through Jesus Christ. John 14, verse 6. Jesus did so much for us. Paul writes, these, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died. What did he die for? Because of you and because of me. No wonder the Hebrew writer says in Hebrews 2, 9, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should experience death for every man. David said, My son cannot come to me, but I can go to him. My wife is precious. 
can't come back to me. I look at the chair that she sat in. I hardly will remove some of the clothing that was left there. It's hard to take. It really is difficult. I, but with the help of God, I'll be able to do it. I tell you what, she can't come back to me. But I guarantee you this tonight. I hope and pray I can go where she is when I leave this world. You see, by living for Christ, what a wonderful blessings we have in Jesus Christ. So many things I wanted to say to you, but I conclude them with a poem that means a whole lot to me. And then our invitation song will be extended. A million times I've needed you. A million times I've cried. If love alone could have saved you, you never would have died. In life I loved you dearly. In death I love you still. In my heart you hold a place no one else can ever feel. It broke my heart to lose you, but you didn't go alone. Part of me went with you the day God took you home. We're going home. Are you ready for it? If you're not a Christian, obey the gospel. The child of God, you need to be restored. Don't put it off till tomorrow. It may not be that you will be here then. All we say is, we love you. God loves you. And if you're subject the invitation of Jesus, give me your hand, but God, your heart. While together we stand and while we sing to encourage you.